Hello everyone, my name is Barbara and I would like to welcome you all to our latest Novage webinar episode. This week, BIM for the design-oriented firm with Vectorworks. Design-oriented firms have unique BIM adoption challenges. In today's webinar, we'll look at general strategies for successfully transforming to transitioning to BIM, with emphasis on the oft-neglected small architecture practice. We'll then conclude with a live look at three design-oriented architecture projects, checking under the hood to see how these project files are modeled and organized. Today's presenter, Texas, Texas architect Francois Lévy, also a Master in Architecture and a Master of Science in Architectural Engineering from UT Austin, where he taught, as well as UT San Antonio. His projects have attracted national press, including Dwell Magazine and HGTV. Author of BIM and Small Scale Sustainable Design, contributor to the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice, is lecture widely on sustainability, BIM, and space architecture, on which he has presented at international conferences. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novage. Novage is one of the largest online stores for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Put us to the test and come visit our webpage at novage.com. And for more daily software news and limited time promotions, pay a visit to the Novage blog and follow us on Facebook, Google Plus, or Twitter. Coming up next week, improve your design review process with Bluebeam Review and earn one AIA learning unit when you join us for this free one-hour AIA CES approved course. Last but not least, today's webinar is free and is being recorded. So if you want to watch this or any webinar episode, just head on over to Novage's YouTube or Vimeo channels for our entire collection. And now, without further ado, I will pass the screen to uh, Francois and he will lead the presentation. Take it away, Francois. Appreciate it. Uh, let me. So the transition is happening. So today we have a little delay due to internet. Um, delays. So um, we should be able to see uh, Francois' screen very soon. A couple of seconds. Francois, we're still waiting for your screen. There it is. Okay, you're on. Okay, great. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you everybody for um, attending this webinar and um, I'll try to keep it informal and uh, hopefully show you some interesting things. I've got a, a short kind of an introductory talk and uh, then later um, in the hour I'm going to delve into three specific projects and uh, hit some uh, ways in which uh, BIM in general and Vectorworks specifically have helped me solve some um, real-world design problems. So uh, I'll try to take it slow, and uh, because uh, we might have a bit of a lack, if uh, there's some disconnect between what you see on the screen and what I'm saying at the moment, please don't hesitate to uh, um, uh, shoot a little message in the chat window, and I'll keep an eye on that, and hopefully all goes smoothly. Uh, so. Uh, I'm assuming that everybody here has an idea of what building information modeling is, and um, uh, maybe many of you are already using BIM uh, for your uh, for your projects. But the thing that uh, I want to focus on, particularly in looking at this definition of BIM, is that uh, we're talking about um, a software and a social environment where a variety of tabular and graphical views are extracted from the building model. Um, and so this notion of extracting views I think is really critical to uh, building information modeling. And view of what a view is. So to me a view is not just a, a um, 
uh, tabular data. So numbers can be a way. In a moment, uh, you should be seeing a sort of exploded perspective of a small project. And of course, um, walls and windows, doors, roofs, foundations. Uh, building information models um, that I represent with these sort of translucent prisms in the center of the screen, which hopefully are occupied, um, what the energy usage might be. The stuff that buildings Francois, the sound uh, is coming and going. I'm wondering um, if we should, are you with your microphone or with your uh, phone? I'm with my microphone. Should we try and switch to the phone? Do you have um Sure. Would you yeah, like to try that, that just in case? Yes. Sorry, everyone. Uh, just a little patience. Uh, we are trying to um, find the best connection possible, so there's no um, dropping of voice. So Francois is gonna try to reconnect via his phone. There are some. Um, Yes, there's some uh, trouble today. Okay, just a few seconds. It will be back shortly, and um, hopefully the sound will be restored and everything will run smoothly. Hang on tight. Stick around. Stay with us. Don't don't make a move. I'll take a few seconds longer. Okay, well, we'll wait for Francois. Um, it, sh it shouldn't take much longer. Okay, I'm here. Barbara, yes. can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. 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 There's uh, so far so better? good. So far so good. Yes, your voice Great. is you're still with us. Great. Okay. Press on. All right. Okay. So, so um, sorry for the interruption. And um, the model can. Uh, what I was saying is that the model can contain uh, information about usage or spaces as well as the physical stuff of buildings that as architects we're we're used to thinking about. So when we look at a component of a building information uh, model element, it's a, it's a semantic modeled um, component. In this case, there, you should be seeing a wall with a window in it. And as architects, we tend to think of the, the graphical representation of that element as being the, the actual wall. And there may be some data that is attached to it. Um, uh, and you know, we, we being sort of graphical creatures tend to think that the graphical wall is the quote real wall and the data is just sort of an appendix that's glommed on. But really from the perspective of the software, the, these are both equally legitimate, equally useful uh, views, if you will, of that wall. So um, all of the geographical or ge uh, geometrical information about the wall, its location, its orientation, its thickness, its components and so forth, are all contained within the building information model. And it's up to us to use the software intelligently to be able to, to harvest that information and uh, use it uh, in useful ways. So what, what building information modeling isn't is just um, 3D geometry without any information. And so while sketch modeling might be very useful, and it, it certainly has a place in architectural practice, what I'm talking about is something that's beyond just sketch models. I'm talking about models that contain data that can be 
uh, used and hopefully later in the talk when we look at some specific projects you can get a better idea of exactly how important that application of the information in BIM is. When firms of all sizes, whether they're large size, large firms or, or small, depending on the, regardless of the kinds of projects that they do, w w consider using BIM for architectural design and production. There are usual arguments about building efficiency, uh, design efficiency, reduction of errors, integration of design, all of those um, are, I think, uh, pretty commonly understood, understood and, and frequently discussed. But one aspect of BIM that um, I think gets a little um, underemphasized is the opportunities for improved building performance. In other words, we have these uh, data-rich models of buildings. If we just use them for better coordination of construction documents, that's well and good, but what if we exploit the data within the model in order to make better design decisions? What if we were to um, take the data in the BIM and use it to quantifiably validate some of our qualitative design decisions. And that's really at the heart of how I used building information modeling and how I advocate its use, not just for more efficient construction documents, but actually as a design tool. So for me, you don't go off and design somewhere and then once you've designed the building, you BIM it up. Really, BIM is at the heart of the design process from the very beginning. So one of the uh, myths, I suppose, that, that uh, people have in their minds is that BIM is, uh, requires a lot of heavy lifting and, and upfront uh, investment in hardware and software and uh, practices and um, that really small projects and small firms are uh, not equipped to handle that kind of upfront overhead. And I would argue that that's actually not the case. And, and empirically, um, in my own experience, I've been able to do some very small projects and, in fact, have, have done projects with BIM workflows of just a couple of hundred square feet and have found the same benefits at, at that very small scale as you would expect for projects of hundreds of thousands of, of square feet, greater efficiency, opportunities for better design, and, and so forth. Uh, and again, there's a notion that BIM is really sort of better, faster, bigger, meaner CAD, um, and that really BIM is uh, good for optimizing CAD inefficiencies, and, and um, BIM specificity really makes it inappropriate for a design environment. Um, but actually, that's not, not the case. And in fact, all BIM authoring tools that I'm aware of have uh, freeform modeling tools, certainly Vectorworks does, that allows you to model components that don't necessarily conform to the standard kit or uh, toolkit of components that you um, would expect to see. And uh, if uh, one thinks of detail, Scaling as a 2D drafting exercise, then building information modeling with its inheritance might seem to be inappropriate for detailing, but there's lots of instances where developing uh, um, thoughtful three-dimensional models of, of detailed conditions actually might reveal something about your detail that a 2D drawing alone uh, might overlook. So it's often the case in my own practice where uh, I'm a develop some details in 3D and uh, even if later they get documented as a, as a 2D drawing, the underlying model for that 2D drawing is, is an intelligent um, 3D assembly. Um, another myth that I uh, frequently get to debunk, at least when I print, is that uh, BIM drawings communicate poorly, that there isn't um, good line weight control, graphic, um, graphic clarity, and so forth. And here I think uh, this is where uh, Vectorworks, uh, one of the areas in which Vectorworks shines uh, in its ability to uh, give the user control over line weights and graphic um, attributes with 
uh, transparency and um, gradient fills and um, really complete control of your of your graphics so that your BIM drawings can be just as uh, rich and informative as hand drawings or, or CAD drawings. I'd like to spend a few minutes to sort of discuss uh, this uh, notion that uh, that BIM is really about uh, production and construction documents and um, and use uh, the McLeany curve to sort of explain uh, why I think that BIM is really appropriate for schematic design and design development as well as pre-design. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Patrick McLeany's uh, little sketch, um, it uh, looks something like this. Here I've, I've outlined the design process as uh, sort of an equidistant grid, right? So pre-design through bid phase and, and uh, construction administration. And uh, you can see that um, if I were to plot the amount of effort in a sort of abstract or cartoonish sort of way that I commit to a project over time, obviously that effort is small initially and then grows over, over time. So you, you could graph effort um, uh, over the life of a project uh, with, this, with this green line here. Is everyone seeing that? Yes. All right. Well, I'm not getting any notes. Okay, great. So, but if, if we look at the effect that our design decisions have, right, that I've plotted on this red line, which you should see now or, or shortly, um, uh, let's look at uh, building performance, uh, for example. So, early on in the design process, when we're siting a building and uh, we're sort of at a party level or, or even uh, taking apart program and really thinking about the interrelationships of spaces, for example. Early on in the design process, uh, we make uh, decisions that might be uh, fairly straightforward in order to execute how we orient the building, what the aspect ratio of the building, where it sits on the site, at a very conceptual massing level. But those decisions have a tremendous amount of impact ultimately on building performance. Um, for example, um, in a climate like where I practice in Central Texas, the exact same building, if it's oriented 90 degrees um, in one configuration with a long, long axis facing uh, running north-south and a broad east and west exposure, that, that very same building will perform about 30 percent more poorly in terms of its energy usage than the exact same building rotated 90 degrees with a long axis running east-west and, and north-south exposure. So simple moves early in the design process have, have a tremendous impact on building performance. Later on, however, once we've sort of accreted a, a lot of inertia in uh, the volume of drawings and design decisions and modeling that we've done, um, if we wait until just before uh, permitting to do some energy analysis, then we're going to find uh, that uh, our options for correcting any oversights or mistakes are really quite small. So maybe I'll uh, quickly redesign some uh, wall systems in order to improve um, envelope insulation or replace a window package with another. But those are going to be very small, small incremental uh, improvements. And they're going to take a lot of work to implement throughout the entire construction document set. So, so the effect of our design decisions diminishes um, as the design process matures. So if you look at you know, where architects traditionally spend their time when in the design process. There's this big hump in this uh, CAD curve that I'm showing you um, uh, around CDs, right? And so uh, a great deal of that effort is taking place um, outside that intersection of uh, that sort of sweet spot where effort and effect um, uh, meet. BIM, on the other hand, is often critiqued for requiring that you do more up work up front. In other words, before I can extract some meaningful views, whether they're elevations or sections or perspectives or even reports, right, I have to develop a model first. That's a critique of BIM, that we have to develop a model before we can do anything else. 
What that means is that, that, that a lot of the design process with BIM is left shifted, that we developed a model that's fairly robust at the schematic design and design development level. And then for CDs, what we're doing is we're extracting views from that model, but most of the work has already been done. You can see that that BIM curve is actually working uh, in our favor, right? Because we're making more of the design decisions early in the design process when our decisions actually have a profound effect on building performance and less of the design work is occurring late in the design process when our building performance decisions um, have less of an impact, right? And one thing that I've done in this diagram is I've, I've made it very abstract and sort of leveled things out, right? Those, those spacing of that grid is, isn't really uniform. But one, one way that I've been quite careful is in the comparative area. So it's no accident that the, the curve of the under the, the surface area of the BIM curve is noticeably smaller than the surface area of the CAD curve. I'm looking at historical data on past projects that I've done. I've been able to compare how much time I spend uh, in a BIM workflow versus a CAD workflow, and it actually gives me more time to design. If you have I recommend that uh, you read uh, the uh, RIBA um, um, Future for Architects paper that came out a couple of years ago. There's a link for it here. Um, and it talks about how uh, architects have to uh, pursue new horizons and ways of working in order to stay relevant. Small firms have to be agile and responsive. But the part that I found really interesting in this report is the uh, uh, anecdotes that uh, respondents to various questionnaires um, had uh, made, and uh, a lot of them were discussing a concern about principles being de-skilled, that there's a kind of a fear of technology. Uh, and as the principal of a firm, I, I highly encourage everyone to you know, get their feet wet and use the tools. Don't just relegate the technology to younger, less experienced um, designers and architects. So it turns out that uh, about, hard to get some solid numbers because it's a shifting landscape, but about 80% of architecture firms have six or fewer uh, uh, members in their firm. So most of us are working in small firms. And uh, it turns out that um, at the same time, if you look at uh, this um, energy input and output curve from the Department of Energy, that about 40% of the energy uh, that we use is uh, from residential uh, projects, single family and multifamily, uh, which tend to attract a lot of small firms in their design. And when you factor in the energy required to uh, build those buildings, not just operate them, it gets close to 48 or 50%. And so what that means is that even small firms have a huge amount of um, control or contribution to make to how we use energy in our, uh, in our society. And so that's one of my motivations as a small practitioner to look at how I can improve building performance through the use of BIM to have projects that have a meaningful positive impact on our energy footprint. So again, uh, what I'm really talking about here is using the eye in BIM, looking at the inherent geometrical or relational data of all the different components of your building model, um, and uh, either using uh, straight out of the software tools or some customized tools that I'll show you for making better design decisions. So uh, quantitative design, sort of an analysis of our design decisions, informs our qualitative design decisions that we make as architects doesn't mean that it replaces right? We still have um, our design sense. We're just validating it rather than guessing. And um, I want to emphasize that when I talk about energy analysis or building performance analysis in the context of BIM, I'm not necessarily talking about full-on energy modeling. I'm talking about looking at different design options uh, assessing their quantitative implications and then trying to make a, a relatively improved 
comparative design decision. So I'm talking about using BIM as a, again as a design tool, a comparative tool, rather than necessarily predicting real-world performance. And I think you'll get a better sense of that in a few minutes. And uh, in, in recent years, uh, a lot of software uh, developers uh, have built in some uh, energy analysis tools right in building information modeling authoring packages. So for example, Vectorworks has Energos, which I'll show you briefly uh, in a few minutes, that makes this kind of process uh, even, even easier rather than sort of custom building worksheets on your own. So some of the challenges of using uh, building information modeling in, for, for any practitioner, but particularly in a design-oriented firm, has to do with when you appropriately introduce information, right? So I think this is one of the reasons why so many firms like to model in a loose uh, 3D sketch modeling environment and then uh, abandon their model and resort, resort to CAD in order to implement the documentation that design. But it doesn't have to be that way. So, so the AIA, for, for various reasons, has developed um, with other stakeholders uh, this BIM protocol having to do with uh, LODs or levels of development. And so there's a concept in BIM that, that models and parts of models can have uh, varying levels of granularity and still be useful. So even at an LOD 100 um, sort of massing model uh, orientation location, uh, there's some opportunities to harvest some data from your building information model and make better design decisions. And so LOD 100 models might look something like this, a, a sort of a, a sketch model with uh, very little uh, detailed information, massing, orientation, maybe some, some openings. Maybe at this level you're making some basic decisions about uh, sun orientation, responsiveness to climate, uh, roof overhangs, and so forth. At LOD 200, uh, you may be assigning some uh, more specific information to your windows and doors, for example, reflectivity of roofs, um, some actual wall assemblies. And by LOD 300, you have enough information within your model that you can actually extract uh, design development, construction document sort of level of information from the model. And really, LOD 300 is probably as far as most architectural models need to go. At LOD 400, we're really talking about specific assemblies for fabrication. And LOD 500 models are for uh, detailed, uh, as-built conditions, right? And that's not really necessary for me to know where every uh, valve and fan goes in an air handling unit in order to be able to uh, use uh, its uh, model within a, a larger architectural BIM so that I can uh, tailor my levels of development of my model as the project evolves over time. So I think you might think of LOD as corresponding roughly to schematic design, design development, construction documents, and so forth. But LOD goes beyond that because levels of development can also apply to different components within a model. Again, I don't. I, I may just model an HVAC unit as a very simple model, but I could have uh, a, that, that might be at LOD 100 or 200, but the roof assembly of my model might be developed at LOD 300 or 400, all within the same model. So there is within this concept of LOD a notion of having an appropriate level of information uh, within the model, and all of that can be accommodated within BIM. So it isn't the case that I have to jump the gun and make detailed design decisions early on. So before I, I show you uh, some specific uh, projects, I just wanted to highlight some five uh, key points that um, you might consider if you're either transitioning to BIM or uh, trying to deepen your implementation in, in your own firm. So first of all, I would recommend that you select BIM software based on your actual needs. So it might be that, that for your firm, it's really important that you have the same software that everybody else 
or at least that a large number of users use. Um, I would suggest, though, that your needs to use the same software as the next firm down the street may not be as significant as, as you might think. Uh, there's um, Open BIM, which allows uh, different software uh, providers to interoperate their models uh, through the use of IFC, industry foundation classes. That makes it possible for, say, a Vectorworks uh, architect user to share structural models with uh, a SIA uh, using engineer or someone who uses uh, Revit Mechanical, for example. Another thing that I think it's important to keep in mind is that uh, when you're transitioning to BIM, that doesn't mean you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. A lot of the skills that you've already developed in implementation of CAD or just general 3D model um, development are applicable to BIM. So you don't have to forget everything that you already know. And then the other thing I should say is that, you know, if you think about it, a drawing is a form of a model as well. It's not just um, 3D models that are models, drawings are models, they have a certain level of abstraction. A really key thing is to start manageably and scale up. So if the vast majority of your projects are K through 12 education, for example, and uh, you have a uh, retail commission, that might not be the best choice for you to start using BIM or uh, expanding your use of BIM. Start with something familiar. and. Um, uh, work your way into deeper and deeper waters as you go. And then, of course, I would say don't focus exclusively on your construction documents, but look at other ways that you can use them um, for uh, early design decisions. And then finally, not to be neglected, invest in training. We've, we all have deadlines that we have to meet and pressure to produce drawings uh, very soon or, or some kind of output or deliverable. Uh, but it tends to be a false um, economy to sort of cut corners on training now, thinking that you'll get to it later someday, uh, rather than going ahead and actually learning to use the tools that you already have. So many times I, I meet users of various software, and I show them something, and they ask me, wow, when did that new feature come out? And I'm, you know, most of the time, that new feature isn't new at all. It's been around for 10 years. They just never got proper training, so they never knew it was there. So the amount of time that you spend in training now is going to really pay off very quickly. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to switch over to um, uh, Vectorworks and show you three projects and, and some uh, uh, design uh, problems, if you will, that I was able to solve uh, with a uh, building information modeling workflow. Okay, it's transitioning now, so we're almost, your screen is almost great. Let me, okay, great. Let me know when, uh, when you can see a model there. I can see your screen, but not the model. I can see. Okay. It'll, you have to open the document, open yeah. There it is. It's loading. We see the model now. Okay, thank you, Barbara. All right, so this is a um, this is a, a live Vectorworks file. This is a, a small about a 1,800, 2,000 square foot residence um, spec on a small urban infill lot, and um, uh, I'm I'm rendering it in OpenGL, which is not the uh, not the most um, realistic rendering mode, but it's uh, useful for these kinds of uh, presentations, um, particularly when uh, bandwidth is an issue, apparently. And um, uh, it's a two-story house, as you can see, and uh, got to play with some uh, different root forms. Um, there's a, an element sort of facing the street that uh, screens most of the rest of the house, which actually um, faces uh, an alley. So um, 
I can just uh, give you a very quick tour here. And uh, hopefully you can see that I'm using the Vectorworks Clip Cube in order to peel away the model. And this is something that I do quite frequently with um, key trades or consultants. I'll give them a walkthrough of, uh, of the project and uh, use the Clip Cube to help describe um, the spaces uh, and uh, sort of uh, volumetric relationships. Uh, so for example, uh, working out, uh, looking at, at uh, some uh, spaces in section uh, to figure out where we're going to be running ducting and uh, for, uh, for mechanical, how some structural issues might get, might get resolved. And uh, we can go ahead and peel that down to the ground floor and you can see that um, everything's pretty much um, um, modeled here, um, nowhere, plumbing, structure, uh, stairs, and so forth. So uh, the 3D model is obviously a great visualization tool for me as a designer, and it also helps me communicate uh, with uh, other consultants or trades who, even though they've got a full set of drawings at their disposal, uh, may not necessarily uh, be as adept at, uh, at reading them. So one of the uh, one of the challenges that we uh, that we have uh, in Austin, particularly on these uh, urban infill sort of lots, is that we have some form-based uh, zoning ordinances which uh, limit the volumes to which we can build, and it can sometimes be challenging, particularly on a a, a small lot, to fulfill the uh, client's programmatic requirements and end up with some nice volumes. So uh, we have uh, a, uh, a McMansion tent in Austin, uh, and uh, how that gets calculated um, uh, can be somewhat uh, complex. It's uh, not so challenging when the lot is fairly rectangular, um, as it is in this particular case. But when lots are irregular or have a lot of topography, it can be it can be somewhat challenging to um, figure out what that tent is without the use of a 3D model. Uh, so in this case, uh, there are some rules as to how we can sort of poke out beyond that tent. And uh, actually modeling the tent directly within the uh, Vectorworks file um, and um, allowed me to make some design decisions about roof forms um, that evolve because where the tent starts and stops varies as the as the design itself uh, evolves. So um, you can't really predict what the tent is going to be until you put a building on the site, and that's going to generate the form of the tent. And uh, and then in turn the tent itself will um, influence what what forms uh, the building can have. So it's a bit, bit of a circular or iterative process. And so in this case, um, uh, the way that tended to, the way that worked out is that um, uh, from the uh, street facing side of the building, we, uh, we go ahead and draw a line. And uh, the tent comes in these 40 foot sections. And I used a, a stake object uh, uh, from Vectorworks. And so at each of the, these four corners uh, of a 40 foot section, I, go, I went ahead and placed a stake object which displayed the elevation of the site model specifically at that point. And then from that, um, uh, the uh, tent geometry gets generated, um, as you can see, uh, as you can see here. So uh, oh, I had moved it, didn't mean to do that. So uh, being able to model that tent easily in Vectorworks really made things a lot easier for me um, uh, to uh, make design decisions. And uh, moreover, that tent is a dynamic object. In fact, 
the tent is modeled just with a with a roof object. So if there's a say a one foot change uh, in the tent shape, it's very easy for that to be changed uh, dynamically. In this particular case, uh, another uh, limitation is that we have impervious cover uh, maxima that we that we can't exceed for the site. And so uh, here I've got a uh, built-in worksheet in Vectorworks uh, that I've developed. And it's actually querying the model for that uh, those values. So um, as the slab changes, as the design evolves, uh, the worksheet is getting the surface area of the footprint of the foundation and inputting that into this uh, into this worksheet. And so, um, as my building grows or shifts or moves throughout design, those impervious cover numbers are dynamically being updated so that I can tell right away, uh, even in early design, whether I'm meeting the impervious cover maximums uh, or not. And uh, again, on a small lot such as this one, uh, 3,500 square feet, uh, it's, uh, it's really critical that not design something that isn't going to uh, meet the zoning ordinance, and you can't wait until the design is done to figure that out. So having a worksheet like this is really important because it's it's dynamically being updated as the design evolves, all within uh, the building information model file, all within the Vectorworks file. So I'm not exporting square footages to Excel and then doing a calculation and then going back to my model and changing it. We also have floor area ratio uh, maxima, right? So we had a maximum of 2,300 square feet for floor area ratio. And so again, uh, these values are being tabulated directly from the Vectorworks model so that if I take a foot off or add a foot uh, or increase the condition space of the building, that gets calculated in, uh, in real time and I can know when I've uh, exceeded those uh, allowed maximums, uh, as opposed to making, you know, committing to a specific design decisions and then realizing a week or two later that, uh, wait, I forgot about FAR. So even on a, a small project like this, uh, having this kind of data available to me is really useful that I incorporate it right within the design process. So another, uh, another project where I used uh, uh, Vectorworks sort of built-in analysis tools, some custom, some, some from the software itself, um, is in this uh, duplex that's uh, currently wrapping up construction documents. Um, and uh, the residents um, have uh, physical and or mental disabilities, and so the level of care um, in this residence is really quite high. It's a, it's a small assisted living uh, facility in essence. And uh, it's really important to the client, uh, to the, the nonprofit that operates this, that they have um, can, can focus their efforts on caring for the residents rather than worrying about uh, operational costs. So the whole mandate here on this project was to design something that was um, uh, operationally um, easy for them to uh, to you know pay their bills. So part of the idea is here is to use a, a solar array as part of the project. So again, kind of a, a quick overall view. Um, so uh, you can see that uh, the building is sort of this long. Um, uh, sort of orientation. It's it's uh, oriented predominantly with its long axis almost east-west, broad facing north and uh, and south, and that's easier to control uh, heat gains. And uh, you can see. Uh, 
as I clip through here, it's you know, one story. There's some vaulting of some spaces, uh, but um, some areas not so much. That gives you an idea of the plan arrangement. And here, uh, a very tight construction budget. And so our, our, our goal was to work, at, uh, work, work this in at uh, no more than 2,400 square feet. We went over by about uh, 12 square feet. So as, we were, as the plan was evolving and we were fine tuning some spaces, sometimes uh, by the inch, um, we were constantly getting updates on what our total square footage was, again, by dynamically linking to, uh, a worksheet to the model. That was uh, that was pretty useful, uh, but there's a, a couple of areas where uh, really using the data in the BIM uh, model to make some design decisions. So, uh, for example, we have these uh, these thermal chimneys, uh, these two passive cooling devices, and there's a, a custom worksheet that I've developed for that. And um, what that does is it estimates the uh, airflow from the stack effect of the thermal chimney based on the surface area of the, a lower opening and an upper opening and the height difference. And all of that is, is pulled from the model so that um, as uh, the design evolves and this thermal chimney gets taller or smaller or we try to optimize the window opening, we can just update this worksheet and um, see what the impact is of those design decisions uh, pretty much in real time. Uh, then another tool that was really uh, quite useful in this project is uh, uh, Vectorworks built-in energy analysis tool, uh, Energos. And so all of the walls and uh, slabs and roofs have um, a uh, uh, data associated with it. So let me go over here to the uh, building elements list. So there are wall styles that are established and uh, R values assigned to all the walls. There's a solar heat gain coefficient and U factor assigned to all the windows and doors, just as you would with a simple uh, energy analysis tool like um, uh, ResCheck or ComCheck except that Vectorworks is uh, checking your orientation, and so it's giving you uh, kind of a result of the uh, total project uh, energy use. So in this case, we were getting a total annual energy use of about uh, 31,000 BTUs per square foot per year. Um, and so that informed about the size of the PV array. So uh, using a simple online tool like PV Watts, I sized the, um, optimized the size of the solar array so that it would um, meet the um, annual energy use. But there was a, a bit of a back and forth because, um, as I'll show you here, um, might take a moment uh, if we've got some lag, but. If you're not already, you should be seeing a, a solar animation that I developed for this project. Uh, Barbara, is that is that up yet? Yes, yes, it's up. It's it's uh, playing. Okay, great, great, fantastic. So so as the design was evolving, the height of the thermal chimneys was uh, was being fine tuned, and their exact placement was up for grabs. So you can see that this. Uh, the position and this and and layout of the solar array is designed so that uh, there's a minimum amount of shading. And so here we've got a, a, a PV array and a thermal chimney, and how do those work together, right? And so using Energos to uh, estimate the annual energy load and and how to size the PV array was was um, was very useful. And then using the um, built-in tools like the thermal chimney, we could see that, for example, if we lowered the, the thermal chimney by about two feet, uh, we only lost about 200 square feet 
of uh, you know, 200 cubic feet per minute, excuse me, of, of air uh, movement through that thermal chimney. And so that was a, a pretty minor reduction in the thermal chimney's passive cooling capability. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it was giving us a lot more options in terms of the uh, arrangement of the PV array. So this is a, sort of a great example of how multiple tools are being used together within BIM in order to make a design decision where each individual tool can't, or each individual component, the PV array, the wall assembly, the thermal chimney, aren't independent. They're all interrelated. And so uh, being able to coordinate all of those things within Vectorworks was really uh, pretty key to optimizing this design. Uh, and then the, the last project that I want to show you today is uh, about a 2,600 square foot house in a rural setting. And uh, that's coming up in just a moment, as soon as it renders. So to give you a, a, a bit of an overview, again, it's a pretty uh, crude uh, OpenGL modeling of, uh, of the project. Uh, and certainly develop uh, higher quality renders as, as needed. Uh, but again, had the, uh, had the opportunity here to orient this building uh, with a long axis uh, east and west. Uh, so you're looking at the, the north face here, um, minimal uh, west and uh, east exposure, and then uh, south over here. So this is um, east, obviously, south, and then west. And you can see that it, too, has a thermal chimney. So uh, same sort of idea here, have a, a high area in the, in the project, that, uh, lots of glazing that gets nice and hot. Hot air rises, open the window. The hot air evacuates out the thermal chimney, and that draws cool air from, from other areas under porches through the house. And it's a great sort of a passive cooling strategy in a hot, humid climate like ours. Um, here, uh, we're outside city limits, so we could use uh, rainwater harvesting for potable water. So there's a, a cistern back here that we've modeled on the site. Uh, but sizing that cistern was uh, a function of the roof area, right? Not the actual surface area of the roof, but its projected area. So here again, there's a worksheet um, that I uh, developed based on rainfall data to give us a, a cistern uh, volume uh, based on the available foot roof footprint. So there were areas uh, that were uh, designated as irrigation areas in the landscaping, and those contribute to our water uh, usage. Uh, make basic assumptions about uh, occupants and daily uh, consumption, uh, duration of drought and rainfall data and so forth. And that gives us uh, the size of the cistern so that as the uh, roof increases or decreases in size, um, the cistern requirement is um, uh, changes correspondingly. Um, not so much energy usage, but uh, important nonetheless. We have a uh, pretty large uh, public space uh, living room here. Uh, and uh, with the concrete floors, I was concerned about uh, sound quality in, in this space. And so developed this uh, uh, worksheet. Again, it's a, a spreadsheet built right into Vectorworks that calculates the uh, reverberation time and compares it to optimal values based on the material selections. And uh, this was used as a design tool uh, to see whether we needed to have some acoustic treatment in, um, in the ceiling and part of the walls or whether we could get away with uh, a painted dipboard. And it you know, turned out, you can see from the photograph, that uh, we ended up using that acoustic treatment, which was a an architectural feature as well as a uh, performance uh, feature for the space. 
and uh, that decision was really driven by these uh, calculations. And then as we were uh, taking this project to various contractors and asking them for uh, bids, one of the things that we did was um, uh, peel apart the building information model and generate lists of, um, of material takeoffs. And so again, the, the model uh, was um, producing that for us. So here's another view of the model. And a uh, simple worksheet um, that uh, queries the model and generates a square footage takeoff for uh, various exterior wall surfaces, materials, uh, amount of uh, painted chipboard, and so forth. And that was useful to provide those numbers to contractors uh, for uh, hopefully more accurate uh, bids. And then uh, also did solar animations and a variety of different sun studies um, with this model, uh, just as I showed you with the uh, with the Hope House model. Uh, so in, in this case, fully rendered, but works just as well uh, without uh, textures and, and materials. So uh, lastly on this project, uh, um, another interesting use of building information modeling tools, Vectorworks tools, is um, if, while we had a large site and could orient the building any way we, we wanted to, if we, we ran the house parallel to the contours, we ended up having a minimum amount of cut and fill. And so we used those site modeling tools in Vectorworks to determine the cut and fill, uh, but we would have lost three trees um, within the building area that the clients wanted to, to, to place the building. And moreover, we were about 50 degrees from uh, a southern azimuth orientation, which would have been a, a pretty big hit on our PV performance. On the other hand, if we, if we optimize the house to be perfectly aligned with the sun, then we have a whole lot of cut and fill. We don't lose um, any trees but we'd end up being about nine feet out of grade. And that, was, that was pretty significant. So by, by looking at these um, two criteria, how do we best optimize for solar, how do we minimize cut and fill, and uh, minimize the, the degree to which we are out of grade, we ended up finding this sort of happy medium where we could um, orient the house about 15 degrees from south. That was a minor performance loss. Uh, we didn't lose any trees. Um, cut and fill was, was still present, but we were only six feet out of grade at one corner of the house instead of nine feet. And that started to suggest this uh, cantilevered slab design to, to sort of mitigate that, and that, that worked out well. So here again, uh, an example of how uh, comparing these, these uh, the outputs from these uh, built-in building information modeling tools, in this case the Heliodon and the site model, uh, helped us find a design decision that was um, sort of a, a good synthesis of those concerns. Uh, well, I, thanks uh, very much for your time. I'm more than happy to uh, take a few questions if, uh, if time permits. And um, if you have some questions later, please uh, feel free to email me. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Francois Levy, and my firm on Facebook is uh, Levy Kohlhaas. Thank you, Thank Francois. You. Thank you. Yes, we do have a few questions. First of all, a lot of people uh, wanted you to share again the link uh, for the RIBA report. Do you have it? Oh, yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, let me, let me find sure. that for you there. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Yes, hope you guys uh, write that down and uh, or you know, I remind I want to remind everybody that this webinar is recorded. So, if you have any um need to go back and look at these um PDFs, uh, the the presentations and 
you can go to our YouTube and Vimeo channel, Novage, and um, the webinar will be there as soon as today. Um, so yeah. I just assigned or shoot, or shoot me an email. Yes. So I just assigned you a question. I'll read it for everybody. Um, so does BIM method works well for the design development stage, um, which requires tons of changes and modification, uh, or, or maybe it would be better to get it after? No. Um, I, I, start, I start BIM at the cocktail napkin stage. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing my massing models in Vectorworks. I'm site modeling immediately. I'm putting in my setbacks immediately. I'm working out my volumes right away. Um, this is a radical change in how architects uh, tend to design. Like there, there is no separation for me between design and documentation. Um, it all flows together really without any interruption. And I see firms that they do their 3D modeling in SketchUp, and then at a certain point when the design is done, they set that aside and they um, um, you know, draft it in 2D with you know, Vectorworks or whatever. And to me, that's just a huge lost opportunity. And it's very inefficient. Because what happens in design is, the design evolves, and, and, and there are always last-minute design changes or refinements. And so you, you've just jettisoned a really powerful asset because you, you've thrown away that model. So I highly recommend you start with BIM right away, not you know, after design development. Sounds good. Um, does a 3D model link to 2D plans, and it can generate all permits, construction, drawings, etc.? Yeah, that's a great question. So let me just, uh, I'm back over here in Vectorworks. Uh, so this is the model that I've been showing you. And then within the exact same file, these are the, these are the CDs. So um, uh, I'm just going to page through each of the drawings. Uh, they're in color. Let me go ahead and change that to black and white. Um, so I'm just, I'm just paging through here my uh, my CD, door window schedules, elevations, building sections, um, interior elevations, details, all of this is in one single file. Okay, so there, I, I think that just answered uh, Tim's question. Can we yes. see a, a typical working drawing elevation or section of one of these models? So. Yeah. There, there you go. go. <laughs> and somebody wanted to know the configuration of your Mac. Yeah. So right now um, I'm I'm doing this. Um, uh, right now I'm doing I'm doing this presentation on a two-year-old MacBook Air, um, and um, it's uh, actually works works fine. Um, I see I see people run Vectorworks on. Uh, uh, flat screen IMAX all the time. If you want to do some heavy duty animations or photorealistic renderings, then you're probably going to want to step up to a more powerful machine. But you can certainly do OpenGL renderings and day-to-day -day production and conceptual modeling work actually in a pretty light footprint. All right. So we have a question now from Neil Barman, who is an old friend of Novage. Um, Neil is a contributor. He writes a great Vectorworks review every year. And um, check it out on the Novage blog. It's really very popular, and we are very thankful for that. It's a great um, piece of advice and a great review. So his question yeah, is, hi, what, Neil. Yes, what method did you use for getting the areas you needed from floors and roofs? Built-in reporting in Vectorworks or customized techniques? Yeah, so, the, so um, all of these are built-in reporting. Uh, these are customized techniques. That is to say, I, I create a new worksheet and I just drop in some script. Uh, but it's it's really it's really pretty easy because uh, there are when you create a worksheet in Vectorworks. Let me I'll just go ahead and um, I've got to move my let's just go ahead and 
uh, create a new worksheet. All right, so if I wanted to say get area, I can just start by having an equal sign, and then right here from the menu, um, under insert, there's a function. So I don't have to remember all the functions. I can just pull one down. So I'll just go ahead and choose area, right? And then I can insert criteria. So I don't have to remember what all the criteria are. I can say, yeah, I want to pull together uh, from the uh, foundation layer. I want to pull together everything that is uh, in a um, you know, floor concrete class, right? Which there isn't anything right now, but uh, but and it'll tell me, you know, how many objects are are there. So so I can go ahead and and put together this little piece of script just from uh, pull down menus in Vectorworks. Awesome. Okay. Um, uh, what is, where is the so a great question from Jim? Where is the line between design liability in a BIM environment? You're doing calculations for rainwater acoustics. Um, so uh, comment on that? Yeah. Well, so for example, when I provide floor area or, or area takeoffs to um, a contractor, I've got a standard um, letter and disclaimer that basically I'm providing that to them as a convenience. And uh, it's, it's up to them to use that information responsibly. Moreover, I'm human and not perfect, and I use software that is developed by humans, and you know, there may or may not be errors in my calculations, so they need to use it at their, at their risk and at their discretion. Um, I'm very careful not to promise my clients that the energy analysis that I'm performing as a design tool is a predictor of real-world performance. What I'm doing is I'm using those energy analysis tools to make comparisons between two different or three different or four different design options and to put together what I think is the best information possible to make the best design decision that I can. So again, I'm not really using these as predictive tools. I don't think that's appropriate or responsible. I'm using them as design tools. At the end of the day, I have to produce a building uh, design that can be permitted and built. I mean, I have responsibilities as a as a licensed architect that I take very seriously, and and so I have to be careful and thoughtful. But that's no reason to shy away from using great tools at my disposal. Okay, I'm going to assign you another question, and the question is. Was the acoustic analysis done within uh, Vectorworks? Did Vectorworks provide the reverberation data? No, no. So the acoustic analysis was done within Vectorworks, but it's not. Um, it's it's a, a simple method for calculating reverberation time based strictly on the surface area of materials and the. Uh, acoustic reflectance or alpha of that material. So I would refer you to um, uh, mechanical and um, uh, it's called Mead Mechanical and uh, Electrical Equipment for Buildings. It's a big fat reference book and there are some methodologies for calculating reverberation times within Mead. Um, so what I did is I, I um, gathered the surface area of materials from the Vectorworks model and assigned uh, an acoustic uh, reflectance or alpha to each of those materials based on you know readily available literature. So Vectorworks didn't do a ray trace analysis for acoustics or anything like that. It's it's a worksheet so that I could see well, okay, if I you know if I double the amount of wood ceiling in a space. Does that help my reverberation time? Or if I change the, the concrete floors to wood or to carpet, what does that do? So again, it's a comparative tool for making design decisions, not a predictor. Sorry. OK, next uh, question. Did yeah, you? Eric, yeah. Eric said, I love your worksheets. Does my book get into 
specifics yes. on how to create them. Uh, it gets it gets pretty detailed. Yes, it's not a step by step software manual for VectorWorks, um, so it it doesn't go down to say a you know provide you with a step by step for doing the, the scripts, but it's it's quite detailed and still general. And then, so how is phasing? Yeah, how is phasing dealt with in an existing building? How do we show existing demolition and proposed works? I tend to deal with that with layers. So I'll have a layer for uh, existing to remain. I'll have a layer for new construction, and then I, objects that remain just stay within their classes, and objects that are uh, to be demoed get assigned to a demolition class. That's how I deal with it. Um, it works reasonably well, and sometimes the demolition is quite complex, and uh, you need to, you know, be a little finicky with how you how you use that methodology. But I don't have a separate demolition layer for say demolished electrical versus demolished plumbing. It's all getting dem demolished, so it's all in the same demolition class. All right. Did you get my next question? Um, Always okay. Uh, how do, mul how do yes. multiple office employees? Yeah. yeah so, um, so VectorWorks has um, uh, work group referencing and project sharing. In fact, uh, project sharing just got revamped in 2016, and it's uh, it's really quite uh, excellent. And so, um, there are ways to have one, two, three, four, ten people work on a file file and still benefit from having a unified file, essentially you have uh, uh, everybody gets uh, layers checked out to them. So, so the, the design layer is the kind of the unit of collaboration and uh, different, different members of the work group get different layers assigned to them and, and different members of the group can have different uh, access privileges. So some people can create symbols and others can't, and all of that is controlled by an administrator. So it's, it's a pretty great system. All right, and when do you forego the 3D model and just do 2D de details? Um, pretty much the only pure 2D drafting that I do is for my detail sheets and those are generally overlaid over the 3D model. So, so I use the 3D model to block those out and then the 2D details are drafted but um, the, the, the model itself can be fairly detailed and provides a lot of that information already. Um, and and then it's really line weights and fills and things like and annotations that go in um, in the detail. Uh, but um, but the model stays live throughout the entire design process. So I'm keeping the model live even during construction administration. So if there's uh, if there are some ASKs or or RFIs, all of those go into the file any sort of design adjustments in the field get reflected in the model. The model is live from, you know, pre-design all the way, you know, in sort of feasibility studies all the way to the end of construction. Okay, I've, um, let's do one more question because the time is sure. up. Um, how do all of yeah. your engineering anal analysis affect your professional fee? <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, well, that's an easy one to answer. I don't charge enough. <laughs> <laughs> Never, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I know. Um, basically, I'm using that analysis as uh, again a lot of a lot of these worksheets. I'm not necessarily sharing with my clients because I don't want to, um, you know, imply a certain commitment of really their design tools, their internal documents. Now, sometimes I'll share them with the client, but I don't, I make it very clear that I'm functioning as an architect and not as a consultant. If the project requires a proper energy analysis, then we're going to go out and, and get an energy consultant. Okay, sounds good. Um, uh, Francois, I'm going to take the screen back. I want to thank you for uh, an amazing presentation, and that's what the information in BIM is all about. I mean, this was if if, if this didn't sat, didn't satisfy all the attendees, I don't know what did. 
and we have already great feedback. So I want to thank everybody for attending and I want to remind everyone to visit our page at Novedge.com where you can find all Vectorworks products. Novedge is the best way to buy design software online. And also visit us for information on specials and releases and we're on Facebook, World Plus, Twitter, you name it. And don't forget the next week webinar is about uh, improve your design review process with Bluebeam Review. And um, to watch today's webinar or previous one, check out our Novaj YouTube and Vimeo channels. And I know a lot of you will need to do that because the information was packed in this one. So thank you again for joining us and thank you so much, Francois. It's always a great pleasure uh, pre having you present uh, our webinars. I hope it will happen again soon. Thanks very much, Barbara. And thank you everybody for attending. Please don't hesitate to email me. Uh, Francois at Bye-bye. Bye-bye.